Good morning, church. Today's scripture will be coming from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 16. That's Luke 15, 11 through 16. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set up for a distant country, and then squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the, whole fam- in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to feel, fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Thank you, Elijah. It's another great day to be able to worship God and to be able to serve Him and to be able to look at His Word. Next week, I'm going to be going to a, it's it's actually called a symposium, Angel Fire Symposium. I don't know what the difference between that and a lectureship or a meeting or whatever is, but I'll be symposed by next time you see me. So, I don't think it's visible, but anyway, uh, I'm looking forward to that. So, Ken Fox is going to be preaching while I'm gone, and he's going to be presenting what he did in Cambodia for about six months, so you might bring a lunch. Just just saying, I mean, it, he was there for quite a while, so, no, that should be a great time to hear about all the things in, that uh, he was doing over there. So lots of good things. Let me just say before we start on prodigal that this is a huge story and we're not going to get done today because I know you didn't bring your lunch today. And so I'm going to take the middle part out of it because we can't get to the end and the end will be another time when I get back. How's that? So we will do the end but I just want you to know that there are some things left out as I'm doing this. So when we talk about prodigal and talk about what it means and talk about how this fits in our life, I want us to really understand this because I think this is one of those things that is huge for us today in being able to know and understand our world and how to relate to it. And what I've been talking about and trying to understand lately is about the gospel. What does gospel mean? What is our message to the world and how would we say our message to the world? And so today I want us to really understand what that means for us and talk about this concept because Jesus tells this parable in trying to get that point across. And so as you look at Luke 15 and starting with verse 11, there's a man who has two sons. This passage is not about social reform. This passage is not about the poor or the needy. This passage is about a son that is prodigal who needs to come back to his father. So this passage is more about gospel than it is about social need. And I don't want you to think I'm against social need just because that isn't really what this parable is even about. But I want you to get the story and what does happen. And Elijah does such a good job in reading to us. And so most of you even know this story already. So there's a man with two sons He divides the property between them. Younger son decides, well, not only he decided to ask, but he also gets his inheritance, his share of the property, and then decides quickly to move and to go to a distant country, go to a faraway place, go to a place that's more fun, somewhere besides home. And so he goes there and it says, you know, he spent his property. Not only that, he squandered his property. Well, and he did it with reckless living. How reckless. I don't know, you can just leave that up to your imagination. Just think about our world today, what would reckless be? And I don't think it's meant to be a historical thing about reckless, just whatever reckless would be in your world. And yeah, we know lots of people who have real disaster in their life, who are reckless with what they would spend. They would win the lottery and a year later they're broke. They would have multi-million dollar contracts for sports or for something else. 
and a year later they're broke. Why? Well, I spent it all. Really? I mean, you spent what I would earn in a whole lifetime in one year. Yes. That's reckless living. Okay? Whatever it is, you can't afford that. And so they find themselves with a problem. And so this wild, reckless living, whatever it is, he decides that I'm going to be just fine. And he might have been, except for the famine that comes. And so the famine occurs, and he's no longer okay. What has happened is he's decided to leave the father. He's decided to run away. He's decided, I don't like home anymore. I don't want to be there anymore. There is this lure of the great city. He is usually a privileged person. Being prodigal is a process. I want you to understand that to begin with. It is not a one-time event. And we tend to treat it as a one-time event. When is a person lost? Is it when they see the city? Is it when they think about the city? Is it when they ask for their own reward early? Is it when they decide to be reckless in their spending? Yeah, somewhere along in there, we might decide, okay, well, you've, you're, you're lost at some point. I, I want us to treat this as a, a whole story. From the very time they decide, you know what? I'm just going to think about me. That's lost. That's prodigal. That's running away from God. And, and so when we look at it from that standpoint, we say, well, but he hasn't done anything wrong yet. Well, I think we've missed the point. Yes. I mean, it's just a matter of working things out. And so he goes and, and he spends everything and the famine comes and he, he does get a job feeding pigs, which no Jewish boy would ever want to do. But then the interesting phrase, no one gave him anything. I just want you to hold that one for a minute. He's lost. Jesus is trying to teach about what it means to be lost. And so when tragedy occurs, he is lost. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. We usually don't say that until that last stage, but I think it begins so much earlier. And we need to understand sin and understand gospel in a different way. For our world, for our time, we need to see gospel as something that needs to start applying with the very first thought of rebellion against God. And so, not to belabor the story or pull it out too long, in, verse, in chapter 15 and verse 17, he says, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise, I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they begin to celebrate. And so as he's in this far distant country, he finds himself in this terrible awful condition. I don't know how long he was there. Have you ever had the pigsty as your home? Because he didn't have anywhere else to go. It wasn't like he could then go into the house uh, and, and then, well, I'll just go out and feed the pigs once in a while. No, he's there, and that's his whole existence is feeding the pigs. And he wants to eat their food, but he doesn't even get that. Not that it's even possible to survive that. But he can't even do that. And he realizes that he's put himself there. He realizes that if I don't do something, I'm going to die. And so it's a decision time. 
and he remembers this father, and he says, I will go to my father, and repentance occurs. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. He confesses everything that he has done. I am no longer worthy of privilege. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just treat me like a hired servant. And he goes to his father in order to complete the decision he has already made. The story is told twice, or the repentance is told twice. First, it is told to himself. Self, here's who you are. You need to repent of this. You need to say, this is my fault. I have sinned. And secondly, he needs to go say it to his father. And as he goes, the father sees him, and the father comes running. The father embraces him and kisses him, and the conversation ends. And they stand there looking at each other. Now what? I want you to realize the pause is built in. You don't see it in Scripture. It comes between one period and the next sentence. But it's there. Because that's as far as the Father is going to go. And then the Son says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your servants. He's asking for a job. He's willing to put himself under his father. And then the father is able to rejoice greatly. Then the father is able to say, bring the robe, bring the ring, put sandals on his feet. It's time to celebrate this son of mine who was lost, is now found. He was dead. He's now alive. And that's the process that Jesus goes through in this whole thing and trying to help us to realize what this is all about. And this is a process of death to life. There's a realization of logic in the situation, a realization of where blessings are. He knows when he's better off. There's a repentance against God and whoever else you might have sinned. It doesn't matter who it is. Whoever else you might have offended, that's part of the repentance that comes with this. And it's asking from a place of humility. And that's what I think we need to realize is the emotion of this moment. He comes with complete humility, and the Father has complete compassion and mercy. The Father has rejoicing, there's celebration. What a great time to be able to say, my son was lost and he's now alive. He's now back. He's, now, he's no longer dead because the Father had considered him that way. The Father did not go to the distant country looking for his son. He waits for the son to come back. We don't like that part, but that's God. He is waiting a lot of time for people to come back. Now what I want you to realize about this story is this is a very nice, clean story. I mean, all pigs aside, this is a very nice, clean story. And I don't know that I have ever seen a story in real life that is so well-defined and that is so simple as this story. Now this may seem like a difficult story, but this is a very clean, simple story. I mean, when you start thinking about that, there's a lot of things that, that this does not say. The story today would be radically different. It would be completely different. There's a realization that this guy is selfish. He goes and he spends it all on himself. He doesn't give anything to anyone. Uh, and no one gives him anything. That just does not happen today. There are so many government programs and so many places where people can apply for help. No one ever finds themselves in that situation today. We don't have that going on in our country. Because there's lots of places where people to go. In fact, they come here, we have a grocery bag that we are willing to give. That's just a standard thing that we would do for every person that comes and said, I have a need. 
I'm not trying to pass out bags today, by the way. But we just do that. That's something you guys do out of the contribution to be able to say to people, we want you to be okay. We don't pay rent. Uh, uh, we're just not in the business of trying to pay everybody's rent. But if you need food, then we have that. And so there are some things that we are able to do to help people. Again, I'm not talking about helping people, but I just want you to realize they don't ever have a time when they say, I have no resources. And I am not against government programs. Please don't think that. That's not the issue here. It's just that they never come to an awareness of the problem. They never get to the point where there is nothing left for me to do. In fact, I think they don't even realize the problem a lot of times. There's this entitlement that someone should do something for me. There is no decision to go back. There is no admission of anything that they've done wrong. After all, it was the famine. It was the famine's fault. We need government subsidy anytime we have a famine, right? I mean, that we ought to be declared a disaster zone. We would be. There would be all kinds of things that would be given, and you would never get this story. And so there's no repentance. In fact, they like where they are. And the realization is, if you scream loud enough, you will get what you need. And somehow we have allowed that to be taught. Hopefully not when they're two. You ought to fix it when they're two. But sometimes in our world, that's what they teach. If you can scream loud enough and complain loud enough and threaten loud enough, you will get what you need. And they are still in the distant country. Now I want you to realize also there are a lot of things that are not included in the story because this is a nice, clean story. It does not mention the fact that this guy is addicted to drugs, alcohol, and porn. All of them. It doesn't even mention his addiction problem. It's very seldom we would see that. It does not mention his pregnant girlfriend that he has with him in the pigsty. Didn't even see her picture there. Or his gay live-in boyfriend. Or her gay live-in girlfriend as she would come. It does not mention multiple marriages, multiple divorces, and multiple children who are in this story. We only have a single guy. It does not mention the huge debt that has been piled up by this guy because he didn't just spend his money. He got 14 credit cards and has maxed all of them out. And collectors are at the door. So it does not mention that, and that is just a modern family, right? It really is. And there's one more thing. That's where he grew up. You see, today's story, that isn't the place where they grew up with a nice loving father who provided everything. They grew up in that family with multiple marriages, multiple divorces, multiple children from all different places, drug addicted, alcohol addicted, porn addicted, and all kinds of people with all kinds of different attitudes demanding all kinds of different things, and no one has home for them. They don't even know it exists. They've never seen it. They've never experienced it. They don't know what a loving family even looks like because it hasn't been in their lifetime. They are now third generation prodigal, and that is our situation. Does that make more sense? This is a nice, clean story. On the other hand, this does not include some of the things from Jesus' time that could have been in this story. There is no demon possession by this man in the story. You realize that? There is no incurable disease in this story, which many times that's where Jesus finds people. And they're either blind or lame or they're beggars and they have been there for life and that's where they are. He's not the beggar. 
And at that time, begging was an honorable thing to do. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. And at that time, giving was something you were supposed to do. And so if the guy sits on the street corner, he, can, he doesn't even have to play his harmonica. He can absolutely, legitimately expect people will come by and will give him money to support him. Not true today. And so that is not in the story either. I want you to realize there are so many other things that go into this story that we don't really see. We don't see the social outcast. And that while they might give to someone who is a beggar by the side of the road, they certainly would not give to Samaritans or Gentiles. That's you and me. And so it does not matter what condition we would find ourselves in if we lived in Jew Jewish times or in Jesus' times and lived in Israel and we were a Gentile sitting by the side of the road, we would be worse than the leper. They would not give us anything, period. They did not help those people. There was very much a racial difference and they would not allow it. And the difference is for anybody non-Jewish. There is no help. There is no home. There is no place to go back to. And so that is not included in this story either. And sometimes we see that today. It is about sin. It is about being prodigal. It is about use and abuse. Taking the blessings of the Father and using them for your own pleasure. And that's what happens sometimes. The waste of everything that we have and maybe even what other people would give to us so that we can do whatever we want. It's wasting God's blessings. It's abusing love. It's doing away with whatever we have. Does anyone really want to be prodigal? And the surprising answer is yes. Absolutely they do. It's amazing really to see that. I talked to a guy one time, this has been quite a while back, who stopped by looking for tin cans. Wanted to know if we had any aluminum cans. Well, there wasn't too many around or anything like that. I said, you know, just curious, he has a bicycle and he has a dog. I mean, right, you've got a dog. I said, so where do you live? He says, I live in the woods right over there. Okay. I said, why? He said, because I want to. He says, oh, don't misunderstand me. He says, I've had a good job. I've been where I even had a family. And I just don't want it anymore. I don't want to have to get up and go to work every morning. I don't want to have to do all this stuff. I don't want to have to be around people where I have to do what they say. I'd rather just live across over there in the woods. And that's what I want to do. I was like, okay. I've got two cans. We'll give you some food. If that's where you want to be, then that's where you want to be. And our struggle today is that a lot of people want to be lost. They do not want to be home. They don't want to come back. They want to be prodigal. Because it's not that bad yet. They still got two dollars. At one point, do they realize, if I continue, I'm going to die? I don't know. So how do we fix it? How do we make it better? How do we change all of this so that you get this response of somebody who absolutely wants to be home? Or should we even try? Well, I think there's something that's got to happen with them to start with. It's not up to us to be able to make them be home. We realize the Father's acceptance and mercy are constant. They're always there. We realize that they need to be home. And maybe we can pray. Maybe we can get them to realize just how broken things are. Maybe we can get them to see how much of their life has been shattered. 
Maybe we can get them to even see what home should be like, that this isn't normal, this isn't what it needs to look like, that there is something better, even if they haven't ever experienced it before. And maybe we're able to pray. Our families need dads. Our families need prayers. Our families need people who are able to pray. And the whole point is they need to go home. I don't know if that resonates with you or not, but that really is the point of the story. They need to go home. And home is not just a house where we live. Home is a place where you belong. Home is a place where you're loved. Home is a place where you're accepted. Home is where you agree to live and serve under someone else. Home is where you're under the Father. Home is where you're submissive to the home and to the relationships that are there. And I think that's where we need to get to. Whoever's willing to do that, I think that's where we can do something. If they're unwilling, we're still standing on the road waiting. And as soon as they're willing, we can run and we can hug and we can say, I'm so happy to see you. And then stand and pause and wait for the repentance. And if there's no repentance, they're not ready to be home. There's got to be the repentance. Our, our struggle is, I think sometimes we try and bring people in that, oh, well, they need so much. They need this. They need that. They need everything. They need to be home. They need to solve the problem of being prodigal. And you can't solve it without the repentance. And that's so essential to this whole story. And he says it to himself, he admits it to himself, and then he admits it to his father. And then the father says, let the party begin, let everything start, let's all celebrate. And that, I think, is the biggest thing we can do. We are the party planners. Okay, How good are you at party planning? Because that's our role. We're home. We're the place where they would come to. We're the ones that they want to be to. I think this fits with a lot of other stories that Jesus told. And maybe we can look at a couple of those just to see this. Looking at what Jesus did. In Mark chapter 2, you see the story of the paralytic. And I know we talked about that just recently. But I want you to look at the wording at the very end of the story. As this man has been brought to him, let down through the roof by four of his friends, and realized that he needed his sins forgiven. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And they're grumbling about that. Well, you can't forgive sins. And he says, oh, let me prove it to you. Take up your bed and go home. Right? That's the passage. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and he went out before them all so that they were amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. And when a prodigal comes home, that's exactly what it's like. I have never seen anything like this. How amazing it is. And he tells this paralytic, pick up your bed and go home. Leave the situation where you are. Leave the situation of the healing. It's not just about you sitting around listening to Jesus anymore. I want you to go home. And that's where the prodigal went. And that's where the guy who's healed of his sins goes. Is he goes home. I want you to realize that. He didn't go back to the farm. The prodigal didn't even go back to the farm. He went back to the father. He returned to the Father, right? That's what he said, I will go to my Father. And Jesus is not just sending him to a house. At least I don't believe. Maybe I'm reading a little bit into this. He had men that brought him in faith. And he tells the man to go home with them. These are guys of faith. You need to pick up your bed. What? They can't carry it? They carried it in here. No, you pick up your bed, not the guys who brought it. 
you carry your own bed from now on and you go home with those guys who have such faith that they brought you to Jesus. And I think that's really what he's trying to get across. He tells him to go home with them. I can heal your disease and your sin, but you have to go home. You have to realize what home is. You have to realize the relationship with God and the life that you're able to have. And I think that's an amazing story just to realize it's the same story. It's the same one. Mark chapter 5 and verse 16, we see where Jesus has healed the demoniac. Great story. They ought to make movies out of this one, right? The guy's in the tombs cutting himself. This could be the horror story end of it. And then he comes out. Jesus comes up and there's a confrontation between good and evil. And, you know, they're all scared of Jesus. And, well, they want to go in the pigs. And the pigs run down the side of the hill and are drowned in the sea. 2,000 pigs. What an incredible thing. And the man has all of the demons cast out of him. And he's sitting there clothed for the first time in a long time and in his right mind for the first time in a long time. And so the city of the people come out, and verse 17 says, And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him. He said, Huh. Go home. To your friends. And tell them how much the Lord has done for you. And how he has had mercy on you. And he went away. And he began to proclaim in the capitalists how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Same ending. There's a party. Everyone marveled. Wow, this is amazing. He had been in the tombs. He had been, what an incredible place. But I want to ask you, how is this guy ever going to find a party? Jesus says, go to the party. Go home. Where is that? The part of this that I find really amazing, go home to your friends. Now, what friends does he have? He's been the demon-possessed guy out in the tombs. And he's still got friends? That's what I think Jesus is saying. Home is not your house. Go home with your friends where you are able to say, let's rejoice over what God has done. And that's exactly what happens. It's still home, but it's with his friends. It's about relationships, and he still has friends. And there is a place of acceptance, and there is a place that you're able to see people care about him. And that, to me, is one of the most critical parts. There is a home that he can go to. One of the things, and I don't usually pull Greek on you. I leave that to Ashby most of the time. You know, he's the guy who's the Greek scholar. But the Greek word for home or for house is oikos. And I found this at, just in one of the dictionaries. It says a number of languages... In a number of languages, the equivalent of oikos or, or kia would be those who live together or those who have the same fence. This being a reference to a group that, of huts surrounded by a fence and thus con constituting a single so-called family unit. Make sense? Doesn't always get taken that way. Sometimes it literally means house. You went in the house. I think in all of these situations, he's, he's talking, talking about, about more than, than just house. He's, he's talking, talking about home. Because, because there are guys who have brought him there, there because he says, with your friends, what I want you to realize today is this is home. You need to tell people you're home. Maybe you need to tell them about your demon possession. Maybe you need to tell them about the horror of sin, that it actually can possess you. We, we know, know about addiction, we see those. those. There's so, so many prodigals, however, who seem to want their own house. 
They want to go back to the, you know, single fence around all of us that says, you know, God's word is there and all of us live inside of that. They want to know, I want my own house. I want somebody to pay for my own place. I want to live by my own rules. I want to do whatever I want with whoever I want, whenever I want. That is not repentance or surrender. And they don't understand the concept of a father's house. They need to understand that. The Father has a home to go to. It's a realization that you've messed up. It's a realization that you cannot stay where you are or you will die. You can't be there anymore. And that you need to go to the Father. It's a decision to go home, to live under my Father's rules, to live under God's house, to become His servant. So what do we do to help people be there? Number one, we be the home. We become the people who have the party. We become the people who are loving and accepting and who show God's grace. That's church. That's the definition that I would make of church. It's a home for the mercy of God. It's that place. We're the people who give the party. You see, we're not giving away forgiveness without repentance, but we're accepting repentance in the name of God. And the man understands there is a place called home. They might have to understand that first. They have to understand what acceptance is. And there is a place of mercy. There is a place of grace. We don't accept prodigals that are not repentant. Boy, you don't get anything then. When you find that, you're able to come home. And let me just say today, if you've never felt this home, this mercy of God, this great place where you feel so overwhelmed because you are so loved and so accepted, there may be two reasons. One is because you're still prodigal. I mean, that might be it. And you have never really surrendered your life or said, I want to give up. I have not come home yet. And number two is you've never seen a real home or felt it before, so you wouldn't know that it even existed. Maybe your growing up wasn't good at all. We need to experience that love and acceptance of being home, a place where you belong, a place of forgiveness, a place where you can get that hug, a place that gives you more honor than you deserve. And then that place exists. It exists in God. And the invitation is for you to come there today. For us to be allowed to have the party. We like parties. Give us a reason for the party. We're going to rejoice anyway. If you're lost today, I invite you to come. Home is here. Come always stand and sing.